everybody, Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, New Pacific 3 Eastern, Sunday 3 Pacific 6 Eastern, Saturday mornings with Jim Valley, 10 a.m. Pacific 1 Eastern, Sundays with Andrew Zarian, and today with both Mike Sempervivi and, yes, Lance Storm is joining us here today. We'll get with him in the next segment here. we got a lot to talk about, and we're going to kick it off with a bang. Lance also watched the Sting Retirement AW pay-per-view this weekend, so we'll get his thoughts on that. Well, we got a lot of news to get into here today. Yesterday was Raw. Monday Night Raw. And the last two weeks of Raw, we've got a WrestleMania show coming up about a month away. It is it is quite a while away. But WrestleMania is two nights, and that means we have to have, what, 16 matches 1820 if you count pre-shows and right now we have five official matches for wrestlemania and the last two weeks of raw has been three hours of continuing the build for the same five matches let's get some new matches here bro but we do have some we're going to find out who is challenging gunther for the intercontinental title next week on raw and i'll tell you who i think it's going to be and who it could be, but who I think it's going to be. And, of course, we've got a bunch of other matches, including on Friday. They will uh, likely make official, official, the Cody Rhodes and Seth Rollins versus Roman Reigns and Rock match for night one of WrestleMania. So we'll talk about that. we got NXT Roadblock coming up here tonight. we got notes on the Dynamite show tomorrow, which, uh, unless there's something I haven't seen in the last couple hours, we still only have one possible match for dynamite tomorrow i think this is the latest they've ever gone without announcing anything else for the show but a lot to get into here today and we'll kick it up after the break observer live But here's the thing. Afterwards, we had this big momentous moment where you were confronted by none other than Nick Nemeth, who was making his TNA wrestling debut. I want to get your thoughts on uh, Nick Nemeth coming into the company. Oh, um, even though he took me out, which I'm going to get mine back when the time is right. Um, but let's leave that alone. Uh, but talk about Nick coming to the company. I think it's huge for TNA. Obviously, um, I'm a huge fan of his. Um, he's a superstar. I mean, he he's he's done everything in professional wrestling. He's been a world champion. He's been a tag team guy. He's been a he's won every single title you could think about. He's had it. Um, he's been all over the world. Um, he has a he he um, he has a huge buzz going right now. And for him to pick TNA over AEW in New Japan or any other company he's working, that shows that TNA is a, is a hot spot right now, right? Um, so I'm happy he's part of the team. I'm happy I get to do something down the road with him. Um, and I'm, I'm happy that TNA is is starting to be a, a spot where people want to come to. Same thing with Ash by Elegance. Um, her picking us over other companies out there um i'm happy she's part of the team and um i can't wait to see what um the future brings with nick and ash and my last question to you is dream opponents you're the champ now man you know you're gonna have everybody coming after you who are some of the opponents that you're like let's go i need to get a match with this person oh man the first one that comes to mind is not he doesn't even it's not a full-time guy in our company but we kind of had a um, had a preview of the tapings in Vegas was Okada. Um, he's a, a guy I would like to have another one on one match with. It's been six years since I had a one on one match with him. I was a kid. Um, actually, it was longer than six years. It was I've been wrestling for ten, so it was nine years ago because I was a one year into wrestling when I had a singles match with Okada. So I was a kid. I was. I was a kid in wrestling, so I would like to have another one-on-one match now that I'm a adult in wrestling, and I would like to see how that plays out.
Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Semper, VV, also of WrestlingObserver.com. And yes, Lance Storm is joining us here today. And we're not even, Lance, we're not even going to even move on to anything here today. Nothing. Not even the retirement of the great Sting. Until we talk about Randy Orton and Austin Theory. I've been waiting all day for this. So hit me with it. Hit yeah, me, baby, I, one more time. Yeah, I, I watched the uh, suplex spot that you've talked about on two or three shows now, and it pains me to admit this. I'm on Team Alvarez with this spot. Thank you. Randy Thank Orton you. slipped. I think Theory had no option. He already had a foot on the top and had his head start getting pulled down. So I think he just instinctively is like, I got a flip or I'm going to die. And at the last second, Randy realized this dude's going to flip and over-rotate like crazy and die. And Randy instinctively at the last second stepped forward, pulled his head down, and hit a perfect suplex. So, yes, Randy slipped. So, ultimately, it's his fault that it didn't go as well. But it's also his experience and just absolute presence in the ring that saved it at the end. Oh, I see. I see uh, Semper Bibi over there shaking his gimmick pen. Yes, Sempi? <laughs> it is a legitimate writing pen, sir. And Lance, I want to ask you, um, even though this was not tragic, it could have been, but what has been in your time, what has been the best save you've ever seen on a spot that was going badly where you saw someone really save someone else from a tragic circumstance. Yeah, there was one recently where a dude... Oh, um... Again, may not be the most, but the one that came to mind uh, immediately was uh, Logan Paul with Ray. When they he did the uh, Lion Salt gimmick back, and obviously the distance was wrong, and he slid in and and save the spot like again ray's aware of where he is ray wouldn't have physically died oh yeah logan paul that was but it yeah. would have looked like crap and and you know screwed up the flow of the match hey, hold on lance stand by for one second jared apparently there's music coming through can you uh kill that what song is it i i, I don't know i can't hear it but the chat's like what is this music <laughs> okay go ahead lance lance has got his own theme music now i love it <laughs> Like as I was saying, like Ray wouldn't have died. He would have been able to get his forearms down and saved himself, but it would have completely killed the flow of the match. But Logan managed to slide in on like one knee and catch the dude and, and save the spot. I thought that was especially considering his uh, experience level, just great athletic instinct. And, you know, I got to say one thing about that as well, because I know a lot of people absolutely hate Logan Paul. But, uh, you know, to the guy's credit, you know, when we watched that, at least when I watched that, and a lot of other people as well, they're like, oh, my God, Logan saved Ray's life. You know, thank God for Logan Paul. And when he was interviewed about it, he was like, listen, I'll take the credit, but, you know, to be honest, I was a little too far out. So a lot of that was also my fault. Like, I got in there because it was just instinctual, but, you know, he admitted that he had also made a positioning mistake. And he did not just take full credit for saving the guy's life, even though everybody else was giving him that credit. Takes two to tango, and he managed to uh, adjust and get it done. And same with Randy. It's like he slipped, and he managed to realize where he was and adjusted and ended up pulling off a suplex that probably ended up getting a better reaction than if he'd just done the superplex. Now, before we get into everything else, Lance, obviously you watched the pay-per-view on Sunday, the retirement of Sting. I know this because I heard all about one of my star ratings, but we don't need to talk about that here. <laughs> yes, we do. You want to guess what? You guys wanted more star ratings to fight about? Well, go up to uh, WrestlingObserver.com. I use, put up my uh, my subscriber-only TV reports. They're going up for all the shows. Raw's up right now. Did SmackDown, Collision, Dynamite every week, and the pay-per-view. And yes, I give my own star ratings. Lance took exception to one, but we don't need to talk about that, do we, Lance? But anyway, what do you think of the show? Um, on the whole, I enjoyed it. And I generally don't watch pay-per-view shows, but um, Sting's retirement got me and intrigued me. Um, I was a Sting fan from Starcade 87, the first time I saw him. 
the six man tag and I thought he was awesome. I was a gigantic sting mark. Uh, I'm trying to find a photo. A bunch of buddy of, of, of mine back when we were high school crazy wrestling buddies got together for a big wrestling show and dressed up. And I do have one somewhere back when I actually had normal hair, but I managed to try to position it into as much of a square flat top as I could. Spray painted it white, not spray paint, obviously. It was whatever cosmetic shops use or, or costume shops use to spray your hair white and put on sting face paint. Um, so I do have a photo somewhere. I just can't find it of me as a, I guess, technically a little stinger, big wrestling mark. Um, and then obviously got to meet him and work with him that one time in WCW. I got a ton of respect for him and I wanted to see the end. And I'm not a fan of a lot of the chaos and hardcore craziness that went on in that match. But when they got down to the end and he won, I got to admit, I got uh, choked up a bit and got goosebumps and uh, ended up making it for a great evening. And I enjoyed it because I uh, got a lot of respect and love for Sting. Yeah. I mean, he's he's one of those rare guys, and they've been coming out of the woodwork. Nobody's got anything bad to say about Sting. And as you're well aware, Lance, I talked about this yesterday, you know, not only does nobody have anything bad to say about Sting, but there's also people that say all sorts of great things about Sting publicly, but privately they say even better things that they didn't even say publicly. So, great guy. Glad to one, see him go one, out on his terms. Literally, exa- that's, a, that's a cliche, but he went out on his terms. He picked everything. He did. The one line that I popped for, and maybe it's a bit of a cheap shot, but uh, I laughed at when, I think it was Tony said, you know, Sting's an even better man than he is a wrestler. You can't say that about too many people. And I'm like, eh, one might say that Warrior was a better person than a wrestler, and that's just because both bars are so low. <laughs> <laughs> One thing for sure is Sting went out a hero. To wrestling fans, he went out a hero. Even those times where he dabbled as a heel, being put in that position by the main event mafia or, or the NWO, it's not like he changed his style. He may have added an eye poke for comedy here or there, but he was always Sting. And once he became a babyface in 1987, after he turned on Eddie Gilbert and started that in the UWF, he became the guy that wrestling fans could believe in. And he was that all the way up until that night a couple of days ago in Greensboro. It's just an amazing, amazing career. So, Lance, what did you think of the rest of the show? What were the highs and lows? Um, highs for me were were definitely Osprey uh, Takeshita. That was, I think, uh, my favorite out of the night. Second, I would go with Danielson and Eddie Kingston. As far as a match, obviously, as far as the emotion goes, I give it to Sting. But again, I'm not a fan of the, we'll brawl around ringside, we'll go through tables, we'll go through glass, we'll do stunts. So those, the, as a match, it didn't do much for me until the end uh, with the near falls. But those two matches, the Kingston-Danielson and the takeshita Osprey, to me were the, the top two. The, the tag team match, which obviously was, you know, very well received, I prefer the more traditional FTR classic old school wrestling tag team match where Moxley is that free spirit wild fighter guy that doesn't really follow a traditional format of any kind whatsoever, which works for him. But I much prefer uh, FTR in a different environment. So that match, while good, wasn't as high up as I would like. I, I prefer the more traditional Midnight Express style tag team match that FTR is so great at. Um, two little nitpicks that bothered me on the show. Actually, hold your uh, thought right there. We'll get nitpicks after the break. Nitpick Observer Live! We'll be right back. Talk to us about the process of bringing her in and yeah. just how you felt about that. Uh, listen, more than anything, I can identify with people coming out of another company and maybe feeling like they never got utilized to their fullest potential. And, you know, that's how she felt. And I didn't know Ash before. And, of course, we, you know, it's a small world, the wrestling world, whether you know people or not, you feel like you know them, you know of them, you know people 
you know, there's always a connection. And so many people were telling me, you know, she wants to work. She wants to do something, you know, generally she could go say to AEW or something like that. And you just never know what's going to happen. At least I think we are known for at least pretty much when someone comes into our company, we're going to utilize them. Um, I think that's a known fact and people can just sit back and watch our product and see that. And also the knockouts division is also, Hey, we average three female matches on a pay-per-view. Uh, we pretty much use every single girl in that locker room. Um, that's enticing to talent, right? And they want to be used and they want to, and I've heard about her work ethic. She's really expressed and every other person that worked with her vouched for her work ethic. I respect that. You know, I, I like those people who are hungry and want it and want to add something to our division. And I think she's going to be a great addition. I think she's already made a splash and now let's see what she's got in the ring and everything else. And I can't wait to see her new character and what she wants to bring to it. She's excited. Um, so I think the fans are going to be pleasantly surprised, right? I just can never give her enough props because of not only the performer that she is, but the human being that she is. You know, she's never changed from the girl that I met in NXT. I worked with her. I think people forget when she first came into WWE because I was there on the main roster and she was, and of course, everyone coming into the company is going to be all timid and nice. She's never changed from that person. If anything, she's only gotten better. She is so, it's a testament when you see her interact with the fans and how much they love her and all her loyal fans and the love that she gives back. So I'm talking about outside the ring right now and to see her in the ring. Listen, we can already, we already know she's a star, right? And to see her level up in the ring, because obviously we have a great division. We give the girls a lot of time. We feature them a lot, main events. She has killed it. And I think it just opened up this newfound confidence for her as well. And I, I remember her when she came into the company, I wasn't there actually, I was doing Amazing Race at the time for her debut, <laughs> I missed that. <laughs> I, had dealt, I had talked to her before. And then I saw, I mean, she had her first match with Kylan King, which was off the charts. The show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sembravivi, Lance Storm. Lance had two nitpicks. Mm -hmm. It's here, Lance. Um, Out of character, but... Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> I thought it was really dumb when they announced that the Continental Crown will be fought under Continental Crown rules where outside interference isn't allowed. I'm like... And then Tony... I, one of the announcers, I think it was Tony even said, like in the first match. And I'm like... The outside interference wasn't allowed in that match. They distracted the ref and cheated. And it's like, if you could just outlaw outside interference by a rule, why wouldn't every match in wrestling do that? I just thought that was dumb. Well, as I explained to Vinny, I can make my own storyline. Uh, here we go. Yeah. Because the Tony Khan character is a psychopath. That's why. But it's it not wasn't and he enjoys having it madness and insanity occur to make his job as a storyline booker easier. That's why. <laughs> but it wasn't allowed. allowed in the first match. They managed to distract the ref and cheat. If it was allowed, then Christian has no heat. Well, of course. Yes. The other nitpick, which well, I you're just not supposed was... to interfere, but like the th there's a difference, Lance. You're not supposed to interfere. But if you can do it behind the referee, don't see it, it's okay. This, you're not even allowed to be out there. You're not even allowed, whether the ref sees it or not, you can't. Well, then they should just. Well, of say course, it's ridiculous, but this is pro wrestling. From ringside. Banned, yes. exactly. Everyone should always be banned from ringside. Remember when you have to, used to have a, have to have a manager's license? Oh, I love that. 
back in the yeah, day. It would be the heat when someone's, you know, tag partner would get a manager's license and come to ringside. It's diabolical. Well, you get one of those outsiders that AEW loves to use. You could add a Kevin Gates out there with a referee's license before he beat up somebody. And the other thing which just baffled me once I saw it, it was so cool when Sting's kids came out in his previous gimmicks. I could not believe that they let Mariah May come out in Tony Storm's previous gimmick and do the exact same thing that they're doing in Sting's retirement in a random match in the middle of the show. Like when I first saw, when I saw the, again, Great American Bash 1990 Sting on the stage, it's like I popped and then I, it just flashed my eyes. Like I just saw this like three matches ago when the alter ego of Tony Storm came out. I just thought that was unbelievable that that got through the the checks and balances. Well, well I think the issue they, is there are not a lot of checks and balances. I think that's the issue right there this because is... there's a lot of times where they don't dot I's or cross T's and you have, you know, two matches that start back-to-back -back outside of the ring or you have two finishes back-to-back -back that are essentially the same. I mean, it does happen pretty often there i mean it probably happens in on both sides of things you know way too often it certainly does in the case of wwe but AEW, uh, yeah absolutely that's happens i mean one of the issues is uh aw doesn't do pre-show production meetings where they go over everything that's going on on the show and i don't know why they don't i mean wow. everybody everybody does production meetings so, yeah i even remember when uh it's not really we didn't have a production but like and I, I I can't even tell this story on the air because there's too much profanity. But uh, when we used to do those ICW shows with Tim Flowers, he would have the pre-show meeting, and everybody would have to explain what they were going to do. And man, you never heard so much profanity. He shut this down. He shut that down. You ain't doing this. That's being done later. You, you guys just don't get it. You know how many times I heard that one in a much more profane version. But that would certainly help. Yeah, you think so? I don't know, Lance. You're the pro. You think? What do you think? Yeah, I, I think it would help because, again, that idea of having Sting's kids come out in his previous gimmicks was fantastic. It was a great moment, and just doing it in the undercard on the same show to me was just mind blowing. Let me ask you, Lance, uh, for the guys that you worked for, where. Yeah, well, in a case like Vince, or really, I guess, in any large company, obviously guys are working out details of things with the agent that is assigned to their match or somebody that they're comfor comfortable with. Wouldn't the production meeting, I mean, when does it happen where you start comparing notes to make sure that nobody is bigfooting somebody else during the show? Well, it would be production meeting would be the start of it because all agents are there when they read through the entirety of the show. So there would be the assumption that once you got to the main event and someone says like, all right, there'll be the sting entrance. We got, you know, Steve Jr. or whatever the other son's name is coming out. Someone would go, it's like, um, should we be doing that in the women's match if that's the main event? And just somewhere along the line... Now, it's possible that they wanted that to be a surprise, whoever came up with the idea, and thought, oh, man, it'd be great if nobody knows. It's just part of his entrance. But the fact that they were involved in the match, I would think everyone would know that they'd be in that gear, and someone would have kiboshed the uh, early version of Tony Storm. All right, let's uh, talk about Paul Heyman. He's going into the Hall of Fame. I know, Lance, you are delighted. Very much so, yes. I'm a big Paul Heyman guy. I was a big fan of him as a manager back in the AWA and WCW, the Dangerous Alliance, the uh, original Midnight Express, his uh, arm wrestling feud with Missy Hyatt and all the other crazy, the tuxedo match with Jim Cornette, all this crazy stuff he did then. And then obviously my time in ECW working with him as a, a booker. I was a, a big fan of working with Paul and then obviously his run as an advocate as well as a creative contributor in WWE. It's like you can say what you want about the WWE Hall of Fame, but there are certain people that make it real and give it credibility, like the Bruno San Martinos, the Steve Austins and, and so forth that go in. And Paul Heyman's like that. Bobby Heenan's in there. He deserved it. And uh, 
Paul Heyman is a very much legit Hall of Famer, in my opinion. Uh, I think he has to go on last because there's nobody on this planet that's following his speech, unless perhaps they're putting The Rock in too, and then Rock could probably do it. But other than that, Heyman's going to be your man. Who do you think is the person that inducts him? Because there are so many people. That Sandman. Could... <laughs> I will accept nobody else. Actually, what I saw a post. It was Heyman uh, reposted it or shared it on something. Kayla Braxton, I think, would be really Actually, fun. Actually, that would be good as well, with yes. the chemistry they have, great. it wouldn't need to be long because you don't want whoever is inducting Paul to talk for very long because Paul needs the time. So I think Kayla would be great. They've got that good chemistry. She can just say a few words. There can be that one little uncomfortable moment when she passes the torch to the microphone to him and then let Paul do his thing. I'd be all for Kayla Braxton. You know, it'll probably end up being as Tommy Dreamer because, you know, obviously with the Sirius XM deal that he has on Busted Open and everything, I could see him being somebody that they would use, although... You know, because I don't think that they're going to be asking for Taz or anybody like that. I don't think that <laughs> that's certainly not going to be happening. So I could see Dreamer possibly being used for that uh, for that spot, or even Bully Ray, I guess, too, considering his you know connections there. I don't know how connected he still is to TNA or anything like that. I have well, no Lance idea. works for TNA, so thank God we got him <laughs> here to answer that yeah. question. I, I don't get updates on when people add and leave the roster. Those who show up on the booking sheet are the ones I work with. Vince McMahon is down to only owning 6.5% of TKO. He sold 5.35 million shares and pocketed $400 million in cash. How much is Saudi Arabia's guy buying? Like, what's going on here? I don't know. Maybe he's got legal fees and more NDAs to purchase. Uh, I don't know. He $400 million worth, bro. 5.3 well, million you were, shares. If you were a well, female person that had a negative working experience with him in the past and wanted a payday, boy, I bet you could get one right now. Well, yeah, I think the peak was at $8 million. I think one of them was $8 million, $7 million. We don't know anything about that one. Think about yeah, that. But- well, Think it, about that. We don't know anything no. about the person that he paid like $7 million to. Can you imagine? And could there be civil suits that end up coming down the line from people who have not stepped up yet that, that may step up? You know, I, again, this is... Janelle Grant was $3 million, right? I think it was $3 million. Yes. Yeah. Okay. There was another one that was 7 Mm-hmm. <sighs> yeah. Yikes. Not a good guy. Hopefully it comes out someday. We've got a couple of notes on this weekend. Rampage, 344,000 and a .10. Countdown to Revolution, 213,000 and an 0.06. And it's one of those things where I expect this pay-per-view to do maybe their best number ever or very close to it. And uh, this was the case, you know, way back in the day. Remember they used to do those uh, UFC countdown specials? There was, like, never any correlation between how many people watch the countdown special and how many people watch the pay-per-view. Sometimes you'd have tons of people watching the countdown, and it would do all right. Sometimes you'd have a very low number, and the pay-per-view did great. So, uh, you know, this is nothing for a countdown special, 213 and 0.06. But I expect the pay-per-view to do a very big number. Collision did 455,000 and a 013 Did have some competition from the NBA. And uh, SmackDown, SmackDown 1 is weird. It did 2.348 million viewers and a .64, which is up a, it's up a little bit from the week prior. But this is the show that had 40 minutes of Rock, Roman Reigns, and those segments did... uh, Almost 3 million viewers. 2.75 million and a .75. And as soon as they were gone, it fell to 2.2 million and .57. Why is that notable? Besides the obvious, I'll tell you after the break. Observer Live. How did you feel about your performance in the Rumble? Um, It went, it went really well. Like, all the girls were, they made me look incredible. Um, and thank God for that because like 
they're there. They're, that's, they're there, and they could, the WWE fans can see them every week if they wanted to. But that was, I only have one chance. Like, I felt like my career was riding on that. <laughs> like, that, that's just how it felt. And uh, for all the girls to just make me look as, as good as they made me look, it was, it was incredible. That moment with Naomi, a former Knockouts champion, you guys hug. And then you guys start like, just like going at it. What was that even like? Like, was it deja vu? I don't know. She, well, first of all, the reaction we got was so cool. Um, I thought, I didn't, I didn't expect like all the people to kind of know our history. So the fact that when we were standing off initially, they had that reaction we hugged, they had a reaction. And then when we started fighting, they had a reaction. It was just, it was so perfect. It was chef's kiss. Um, that was so freaking cool. And the fact that we wrestled, what, two weeks ago in front of a sold out crowd for TNA, their comeback show, like for the Knockouts World title, everything was just so perfect. Yeah, she is an incredible athlete and an incredible wrestler. And I never thought I'd be in the ring with her at taking her finish, period. So the fact that that happened was actually crazy um what's funny was when we when everything we were playing the match whatever um and i said have you ever done you know your finisher on the apron and she said no she hadn't we we went over it in a practice ring it wasn't working and we didn't have a chance to go out we know that the the ring aprons are bigger outside uh but we didn't have a chance to go out and like feel it out and one of the producers was like you don't have to have to do it if y'all didn't go over it and I just told her, like, do it. And if there's not enough room, just throw me on the ground. Like, just do it from the apron to the ground. And thank God that didn't happen. But I, I, was, tell, I was telling the producer, like, I would do this in front of 500 people, much less 50,000 people. So I didn't have a problem with it at all. And uh, she's an amazing wrestler. And I feel like she would have protected me regardless of if we had to do it to the floor or not. <laughs> Yes, I was like, when I was watching it, I was nervous because I'm like, first of all, like you're taking this brutal bump. But then on top of that, Bianca, we know was supposed to be standing tall. And I was like, oh my God, what if she like loses her balance? What if she falls oh. too? Like, I was thinking like all of these things, but you guys went, I mean, you guys are pros, man. She's so good. No, no chance of that. She would have been fine. No, she would have no. just, she would have fallen off the apron and landed on my body. And like... <laughs> <laughs>so here's the thing with the rock if you uh, look at this number you know a lot of people watch the rock and then when he was gone they were out of there half a million people so if you watch shows where you know rock is advertised but he doesn't come out at the beginning they they hold the audience much better throughout the course of the show so obviously what you would want to do is advertise the rock is going to be there and then uh, tease him throughout the show and then he comes out at the end. And you would probably do uh, better than this show did in terms of, of total viewership. Especially when he's out there for as long as he was. But here's the problem. Rock did a 21-minute promo on social media. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, him and Roman came out and took up the first 40 minutes of the show. So the issue is, you know... You bring that guy out at, uh, you know, 8.45 or whatever. Like, he's got a very specific time cue that he's got to hit. And, you know, what I heard, and this was before the rating came out, is, well, you know, Rock's probably going to be opening a lot of SmackDowns because it's easier to make it up after he goes out than to uh, try to box him into a very hard time cue. So there kind of been a little issue here where, well, do we bring him out at the end? And, uh, you know, someone's got to be sitting there doing this. Or do you bring him out at the beginning and he has as much time as he needs and then everybody turns off the show afterwards. So we'll see what they do this coming Friday. 
They've, uh, they've, you know, they're doing Rock, Roman, Cody, and Seth on the show Friday. So it'll be very interesting to see where they place that segment. They need to start trying to book him like they did the um, Austin McMahon feud. They would have interaction at the beginning. They would have a tease in the middle of the show, and then they would wrap it up and conclude with them at the end. And, hey, he can always end the show like Sting did the pay-per-view looking at the camera going, I'm getting a time cue, and then they just go away. Well, you know, it's it much easier, biggest... too. It, it, you know, if you remember those shows, what did we always talk about? Long 20-minute promo to open the show. Boring 20-minute promo with Triple H. Well, if you're going to do this with Rock, he should talk at the beginning because that's it's harder to wrap up Rock when he's talking. But, like, if he's doing something physical, he's not going to need 25 minutes. Do a couple spots and get out of there. That's the stuff you save till the end. But isn't the problem is that he's not doing anything physical, at least that we've seen yet. And the whole thing with all of this is revolving around the fact that he's talking. And are you putting him in some sort of situation by having him do physicality? And are you is that a concern? You know, well, no, he, he did he did a rock bottom the, uh, a couple of weeks ago. and He was all blown up, you know, though, with, uh, with Ginger there. I mean, I'm well, sure he can he's do doing it. things, certainly doing things behind the scenes, but it, it, do you think that that might be the concern? I don't think it's, so at all. Well, okay. I think you have to be careful in that now that he's in a specific direction with Seth and Cody, if Brian is right and this is a covert undercover secret plan with the rock that will lead to him helping Cody take everything away from Roman Reigns. They've got to be careful because if he, yeah, you don't want to beaten up Cody it's true. or even Seth, if he's in on it and then if they're out there punching and trading punches, it's like it makes the story not work. So you've got to be careful, but teasing him coming back and not having physicality, but, Teasing it wouldn't be terrible. And it'd be very interesting to see when the uh, Raw ratings come out in the quarter hours because this opening segment of Raw was like the funniest unintentional comedy in the sense that Seth Rollins and Cody came out and literally talked about how, my God, Rock did 21 minutes. Who could listen to this guy talk for 21 minutes? He just droned on and on for 21 minutes, they said. And the segment's over. I look at the clock. They had him out there for 23 minutes. <laughs> and the irony is, not only did they go out there and ramble longer than The Rock did, but they said less. Rock in his 21-minute promo, I mean, essentially, he told the entire storyline that he has created in his head for this entire thing. He filled in a lot of blanks. And ultimately, it set up a big match for WrestleMania, Rock and Roman Reigns versus Seth and Cody. Meanwhile, Seth and Cody went 23 minutes, and literally after 23 minutes, they didn't even accept the challenge. They said, we'll see you on Friday and give us our answer. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. And did it that took forever to say nothing. <laughs> Lance, you raised your hand. What do you think of the Rock's twenty minute? I was just blown I was just away. Raising, raising my hand because you said who could listen to this guy cut a promo for twenty one minutes? I'd give that guy an hour. I can sit there and listen to the Rock cut promos for a pretty damn long time. I'll tell you that. And I was watching the promo, and you know, Seth Seth had to get something out. And <laughs> in his defense, I'm sure he did not come up with this on his own. And I'd bet you anything that it was probably Brian Gortz and the Rock that came up with it. But Seth has to go out there, and this is on him, yes, in the dumbest-looking outfit. Well. He looked like a banana that got <laughs> dipped in nuclear waste. And he goes out there, and on top of looking like an idiot, he has to drop the line, diarrhea Dwayne. Uh, I thought, my God, my God. Hold on, though. You have given Rock so much material in this 22 minutes and it's not material that's like going to get you over brother you look like a fool talking about diarrhea Dwayne well, as a grown Brian, man in your 30s and man rock is going to obliterate this guy if Brian Gwertz gave it to him then God. is this some sort of you know some sort of plan that they're you know setting up on Seth Rollins there I mean isn't it on the wrestler at some point to go look 
Yeah, the guy's on the board. It's you the know, rock. No, he's not saying oh, that. Oh, come on. Stop. So now we got another situation. Why don't where you ask Lance? He's been there. Rock's on the Lance board. Lance and Seth stepping up and guts. going, no, Dwayne. I'm not saying diarrhea, Dwayne. Yeah, unless you're telling me, hey, we already have a merch rollout ready for this. Hey, guess what? Can I come up I'm with sure something other than diarrhea, Dwayne? I'm Although sure the shirts again, are out. I'll look right now. Oh, God. Then again, if he dresses like that, maybe he was all for that line. I don't know. Lance, save I, I me would, on this. I, would, I think I would actually ask. Rock has always been a approachable, decent guy. I think I would ask. It's like, we got something else. That's really say, bad. This is a guy that cuts promos for a living. He's an actor for a living, dialogue for a living. You've got a guy there who's in charge, and Paul Levesque, who made a career out of cutting promos. I think Seth Rollins, at this point in the game, has probably earned enough cachet to go, I don't know about diarrhea, Dwayne. But then again, maybe he thought it was a hot bar. I just, it was terrible, I thought. Well, it's but possible. But then again, this is where we're at with The Rock again, with childish insults. I mean, that's what he does. And it's possible that Seth did say, are you kidding me? This is the line. And maybe enough people insisted and Seth's a team player and took the bullet. <laughs> where's where's the Rocks merch? Roman Reigns. On his own site. Well. He got that Doesn't Rock start with too. an R? Am I wrong here? Or is it look, start with a T? Look, the look Rock. D for Dwayne. God damn, look, it does start with a D or a T. The <laughs> Rock. You have to search by T. Alphabetical by the. <laughs> yeah. Nah, there's no, uh, there's not currently a Diarrhea Dwayne shirt. But by the no. end of the day, I'll Are you still you. upset, by the way, that you never got your A-holes shirt from Braun Breaker? I'm actually and, uh... surprised that we never got that, but whatever. <laughs> you knew they were going wolf dogs. You just wanted it to be the other way. So, a couple of notes from Raw. Full report was on Observer Live for subscribers at WrestlingObserver.com last night. Or you can go to WrestlingObserver.com. My full, full Raw report is up there in text form for all of you. But uh, one of my favorite things on the show was Gunther and Dirty Dom. Love that match. It was a combination of... Well, I should, probably put, shouldn't put the guy over. But I saw stuff like this in the 90s. I'll just put it that way. And uh, Gunther absolutely, completely destroyed this guy. To played total babyface in this match. And finally, he uh, gave Dom this power bomb. Oh, my God. And then put him in a half crab and submitted him. Got an enormous pop when Gunther won. I loved this match. And then later they announced that they're going to do a gauntlet next week, which is going to be a six-person gauntlet. Sami Zayn, Ricochet, Shinsuke Nakamura, Bronson Reed, J.D. McDonough, and Chad Gable. Let me read those names again. <laughs> Sami Zayn, Ricochet, Shinsuke Nakamura, Bronson Reed, J.D. McDonough, and Chad Gable in a gauntlet match which means it's probably going close to an hour and it's probably going to be awesome mm. the winner faces Gunther at Wrestlemania and I think of all of the names there are two favorites okay one of them is Chad Gable and I'm only saying he's a favorite because for the last two weeks they have done a catchphrase Whenever he's talked about wanting to face Gunther, and he he talked about it last week, he talked about it this week, it just means more. This is not just for the belt for me, he says. It's for my family. I want to wipe that smile off Gunther's face and give it to my daughter. It just means more. Okay? And then obviously the other one is Sammy. Because Sammy has been talking for weeks. He has no path to mania. He knows he can be a winner. He knows he can be a champion. And he needs it to prove to the people that they didn't get behind him for nothing. And I think the most obvious possibility here, given that the Raw the week after WrestleMania is in Montreal... I would say the favorite is Sami Zayn to win the gauntlet and the title. 
I don't think it's impossible that it would be a three-way with Chad Gable, but I think Sammy's in the match, and I think he's winning the title. That's my prediction. I get a heck of a reaction in Montreal, that's for sure. You don't yeah, say. Yeah, really, for sure. And, hey, have it, have him go through and face Chad Gable at the end. And have him still, okay, we have Chad Gable in there with Sammy. He still has to go another 20 minutes with Chad Gable. We get a great wrestling match out of it. And during this process, Bronson Reed maybe slips on a banana peel. There's something that happens where, because you got to beat a giant on the way to WrestleMania, and usually this is the for the title picture, but I wouldn't mind seeing Sammy Zayn against Bronson Reed in a one-on-one -on -one match that leads into his match at WrestleMania or is a feud relatively quickly after him getting out of WrestleMania. I kind of like that combination together, and I think it would be a great use of Bronson Reed. And if he is going to be a guy that they can rely on and get over and move up the card, Sammy Zayn is a perfect person, I think, for him to be in the mix with. Well, then we had Nye and Becky. God. Nia. I hear you're not a fan of uh, Nia Jax, bro. God, dude, I'm telling you. I don't know what's happened besides, I guess it's kind of always been like this. But she was so bad in this match. It was just like Australia. The issue, the biggest issue with Nia is her selling absolutely sucks, okay? Her offense is fine. Now, granted, some of it I think she's killing people. Like, she was supposed to do the Samoan drop where you just back up into the, the ring post. But, like, she's not even looking, and she goes backwards and lets go Becky, and Becky's nowhere near the post. She doesn't come near the post, and she just falls off her back and smashes on the ground. And then the big one is Becky tried a middle rope drop kick, and Nia literally didn't sell it at all, but she was supposed to, and she bumped backwards through the ropes afterwards, and even the announcers were like, I don't think Becky hit it. But she did! Anyway, back in a moment with more Observer Live. What made you make that leap, though, from, from gymnastics to pro wrestling? Like, what happened there? Yeah, so my story is um, a little different. So I was finishing up my fifth year at Michigan State in gymnastics, and I got a message on Instagram from the WWE recruit page um, asking me, hey, would you like to come to a tryout at SummerSlam? This was the Nashville one, so in 22. And at first, I'm like, is this real? Like, there's no way that WWE is contacting me. And I was like, you know what, I'm gonna go for it. So I went down to Nashville, I did the tryout and thankfully I was blessed with the opportunity for Triple H himself to offer me to come to the Performance Center and start training. And that's how I got into pro wrestling. I never would have thought in a million years that I would be a WWE superstar. So being here is so surreal. How has that training been like for you from going from gymnast to pro wrestling? Yeah, so I will say it's, very very different it's foreign to me but then again the physicality of it is helps me a lot because i'm able to catch into the small details easier i would say just because in gymnastics everything is based on perfection so i have to make sure i know all the details i have to make sure the margin of error is very small so i believe that helps me in the ring with like body control details just making sure i'm aware um, i have air awareness so I believe gymnastics has helped me, but then again, it's still different because I'm not used to having someone hit me or being in the ring with someone else in gymnastics. It's just me by myself. What was first day of training like for you? Oh yeah, first day of training. So learning how to just control your body with like safety, like rolling and stuff, that was the easy part, but hitting the ropes the first time was so painful and just learning how to bump and stuff. That was probably the most painful being the most difficult thing ever yeah and the easiest like you said before was just having body control and i will say like coming from an intense sports background and into pro wrestling being mentally tough is something that was instilled in me when i was younger and that's been able to translate because you have to be mentally strong in this industry who have you studied oh yes absolutely so starting with in ring wise i would say rvd is someone whose style i absolutely love I love also how authentic he is, how unapologetically himself he is. And that's something that I want to strive to be. I want people to be able to relate to me. And then also Bianca Belair is someone, because she's so elegant, but she's also so powerful. And even she has this sass to her where she doesn't let anyone walk over her. 
So those are people who I studied. And then for promo wise, I love hearing Daniel Bryan cut his promos. He's very energetic. And it's cool to see even his evolution of how he started promos to where he was um, doing promos. Well, we've reached the end of the program, everybody. But Lance, Lance would like to talk to you all about TNA. Yes, TNA. It is back if you've been living under a rock. And it is shoot better than it used to be. Yes. Oh, Miles. God. Yes. And this Friday, it. Sacrifice from Windsor, Ontario, live on TNA Plus and I believe Fight TV. So uh, check us out Thursday nights, Access TV. That's right, Access TV, everybody. And uh, a lot of great matches. Vinny's been reviewing it every week on his solo show. And Vinny likes it. Can you imagine, yeah. everybody, if you've been a long-term subscriber, can you imagine in 2010, in 2010, somebody on the prediction show would say, I'm not even predicting this year. I'm going to predict 2024. In 2024, TNA will still be around and Vinny will voluntarily be reviewing it in a solo podcast at WrestlingObserver.com. <laughs> be like, that, that literally is the dumbest prediction I've ever heard in my life. And here we are. And he's enjoying it. So check it out. Vinny's show. And uh, Vinny and Granny and Craig and Sean and all the rest of us are going to be here tonight. And what are we reviewing this month? WWE... I always want to say collision. What the hell is it? Challenge. 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 WWF Challenge. Come on. Starting from the first one on Peacock. And uh, a lot of people liking it. So uh, check it out. And uh, all of this at WrestlingObserver.com. Shows with Lance at WrestlingObserver.com. Only for subscribers. Observers up there. Wrestling Observer Newsletter Archives. All sorts of great stuff. So if you like the show, sign up. WrestlingObserver.com. And that's it, everybody. Thanks, Lance. Mike, as always, callers and listeners. Everybody in the studio, my main man Dom, the real Dirty Dom. We'll talk to you next time, Wrestling Observer Live.